Gods have chosen their champions to battle to the death. Luckily, they can resurrect them to fight and die again and again. In this fast-paced, hard-hitting fighting game, reading your opponent is as important as rolling your dice. Use different attacks and abilities, cut through your opponent or drive them into a wall of spikes. Pit Fighter features easy rules with gorgeous miniatures suitable for any tabletop skirmish, RPG or war game. Each battle takes only one to five minutes, perfect for a group of friends with some downtime on game night or when someone has to pause to take a call. Become a mind reader, smash your opponents over and over. If you are lucky enough with the dice, you can get critical hits or even one-shot someone. You can also play in teams. Three modular fighting pits optimized for both resin and FDM printing. The city with three different easily swappable environmental hazards and braziers that take LED lights to take your board to the next level. The floating island where being forced back means a fall to your death. The ice pit where something evil lays in the waters to drag your champion to an icy doom. The miniatures have been designed in a unique style by some of the most talented sculptures in the industry. Ultimate weapons are unlockable as stretch goals. All models are designed with home printing in mind and come pre-supported by the best support guy in the business. Hello everyone, so today we're doing something a wee bit different we are. Uh, we've got Greg on. Now, a lot of you guys have been asking about this for ages and ages. But like, let's just get into this. Let me just get the screen up and running. Uh, so, so first off, let's just introduce Greg, will we? Uh, so Greg is, to put it nicely, he, he's probably like, if if you're active in 3D printing, you know who he is already. There's no introduction, let's be serious. Would it be fair to say, Greg, that you are one of the most prolific um, users on Facebook when it comes to 3D printing, I would say. That just that just means I'm spamming pictures. Yeah, I uh, no, I, I would say you're pretty active, and genuinely, it's nice to see whenever it comes to a lot of this sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, anyway, back into this. What you want? So, yeah, well, I mean, the idea was the idea was not to help the merchants, but just regular people, mm. because for the people out there listening who who don't have printers yet, you know, the the printing process is getting better and better as we go, and the machines are getting better and better as we go, and a little cheaper. Oh yeah, um, definitely getting cheaper. It, Still, 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 it's still a hobby, and it still requires some work if you want to properly support models. So, one of the things I think, one of the things that that maybe I did pioneer that that's changed the industry the way it works now, is supporting models for other people. You know, it used to be everyone have to support their own models. Oh and yeah. <laughs> the, the, the way it really evolved was, you know, I was just supporting models for myself, and I saw people having a lot of the same problems that I ran across. So I started. I actually started my YouTube channel and started making videos to help people really because I was getting bombarded with questions, to be honest, on Facebook, like every day, you know, 10, 12 people hit me up asking for help. And I never wanted to do a YouTube channel or any instructional videos, but I was spending so much time helping people and they kept telling me to make a channel that I finally realized if I didn't make a YouTube channel and start spreading my knowledge, you know, I'd be spending all day just chatting to people trying to help them. So that, that was the genesis of the, of the YouTube channel. And then oh. from there, then once, once, you know, people start learning, it still took a lot of time for people to support models. So I came up with the idea with Artisan Guild, maybe we should do this work for people and, and save them 10, 20 hours a month, every month. If you can do that for thousands of people, you're saving a lot of time. And it's also saving a lot of money. Like, see, we're like screen repairs and like, you know, like a lot of people see, like, this is one of the things that I always say to people, like, you know, that want to get into 3D printing. Think of it like, you know, like an ink printer, you know, how hard is it to find a good working ink printer that can actually work, you know, like something that actually prints and doesn't break all the time. You just can't, not even with an ink printer. So what's it like with a 3D printer, you know, it's oh, like you really do need a, it's, it's, it's a hobby all in of itself, you know. And the thing is, and we keep using the word hobby, and I think we should explain for the people who don't don't have printers yet, it's not, we call it a hobby because it's not quite perfectly plug and play. Like you turn on a light switch, your light comes on, you don't need to know anything. You just need to know how to turn on the switch. With a 3D printer, you still do need a little bit of knowledge. You have to do a little bit of research, watch a few videos, learn a little something, 
in order to really make it work properly. And the other thing is you have to do your own troubleshooting. If something does go wrong, oh, yeah. you have yeah. to fit you have to fix it. Un yeah. un unlike other things in life, your car goes wrong, you take it to a mechanic. Your 3D printer goes wrong, you've got to be the one to fix it. So that that's why we keep using the word hobby because it, it's a little more than just buy a printer and and it works you know yeah it's so there is so much to it like and even just i think it, it easily it takes i for me i think it took me at least three months just to like understand the basics and like you know the good thing is whenever you get like say when you get a field print and like you know there's a bit that doesn't quite look right at least it always looks the same and the amount of people online to help like let me get this up here what's your one called Again, uh, printing with 3D printer. Oh, I'm horrible at this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, it's cool. Well, I, think, I think one of the good things is, like you said, because the community is so active on Facebook, mm. if you join uh, like the Facebook group I'm in or uh, Tabletop 3D Printing Guild, if you need help, there's always people willing to help you. Yeah. And, and I do find, in general, the community to be extremely helpful on, on those Facebook groups. You know, I lurk there and help people still as well. So I, I do think you have a lot of knowledgeable people with a lot of experience and, and everyone's pretty nice about helping mm. new people who don't really know what they're doing. So that, that's one of the nice things about the hobby. Oh yeah, the, yeah that's actually one of the things that really stood out to me. Oday, oh, sorry, my dog's barking out the back. Uh, that's one of the, definitely one of the nicest things I've heard. Like, you know, well, definitely not hard, but experienced from 3D printing in general is just the community is genuinely like, they really do try and help you and like you know there's people that will spend like all, like how, how like as greg was saying like you know he would spend hours a day just like helping people troubleshoot, troubleshoot their problems like it's ridiculous for people coming in now though i would recommend to get if they have a little bit more money than that to go for the elegu mars 2 pro yeah which is, you know which is which is their mono screen printer and for those people listening who don't have a printer yet uh the mono screen if you hear us talk about it it's just an, an upgraded screen that allows the 3D printer to work faster and a little bit more accurately. And it also, it's, the screens on these things are, are a consumable. They do go bad. Yeah. But these new mono screens are supposed to last uh, 2,000 hours before they go bad, which is a significant upgrade from the, from the older uh, color screens that they were using. Uh, depending on perspective of just how quick we're talking, normally, like, you know, when it goes down um, and it, like each layer, you have to like, it gets zapped with light and each layer you'd normally for most printers about 10 like anything between really 8 to 12 seconds however with these new mono ones uh they do advertise one second but let's be serious that's not really a thing i've seen most yeah, people right. yeah it's <laughs> like they, they advertise it but it's just not like you know i wish it was the case but realistically it's two but, by but two, two and a half seconds two seconds. Yeah. two seconds is realistic this is one of the things why i really want to get them on was the new pit fighter and um, kickstarter that greg's got now the, what makes it really different and interesting now is because it's a gigantic collaboration like the amount of artists involved on this is how many is there actually i think there's oh god like 20, i think now 20. i now i think we're up i think we're up over like 25 different artists and studios mm -hmm. and and all all the big ones all the best ones are in and and all the good small ones are in it's been crazy yeah and even then like you know, one of the things i like to point out is like you look at like you know the quality of the artists and these artists are genuine amazing like they really are like the, the way it comes out it looks better than a lot of the new stuff like games workshop has been putting out for the past few years like you know i i just think this stuff looks absolutely amazing i'll just slide down slowly on the kickstarter that you guys yeah see. i mean look games workshop games workshop makes some nice stuff but these days what you can print at home is comparable sometimes better and it's like it's definitely better than like what whiz kids is putting out for dungeons and dragons and stuff oh like yeah that. yeah the figures that, that, at home or i mean i i have those whiz kids figures because before i got into 3d printing i i bought a bunch of them for my D D. and now i look at those things they look like garbage yeah, compared they, to it's compared actually to embarrassing like, yeah. I, I don't get how how they could actually have the i they have to have better resources they could put out better models you know they look like it like for me I, like so i started off with like 40k i was i was always more into more wargaming um i was i only recently got into DD. &D. like i only got into like role-playing games maybe in the past four years i think now something about that but uh for me like so i was always i was i always love my models and i'm and, and i know a lot of people like oh theater of the mind's great and all but i don't know there's not nothing beats like actually having models on the table you know um, oh, of course, of course. I mean, like yeah, as a D and D guy, well, I'm I'm a Warhammer guy, a D and D guy. I play, you know, uh, 
war games and RPGs. And I, I was a big Mage Knight guy when Mage Knight was popular, mm. you know, like 10, 15 years ago. But the truth is, well, you can print that at home now. It's just better than almost everything you can buy, maybe with the exception of some of Games Workshop's really, really good stuff. Wow. Um, like the, I used to do an orc army in Warhammer and the I, I print better orcs at home now than Games Workshop ever sold. Oh yeah, easily. I, I would agree with that. And there's artists that are doing like 40k stuff. Like, you know, I, I don't, well, like, you know, cults and all that. Uh, and Her know. What about uh, uh, Heresy Lab also yeah. does 40k type stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. There's quite a few of them. I don't know the legality of it all. You know, well, I, it, well, it's legal as long as they don't take the names from 40k and they just make it look like it. It's actually okay as long as they use their own art and they make their own sculpts. That you know, it, it's actually fine. It's mm -hmm. legal. Oh, that's good. That's good. I don't know. I'm I'm one of those ones. I'm, I'm a bit worried when it comes to Games Workshop. You know, <laughs> like let's well, be honest with you, they do have a yeah. reputation. Like you know, they just do have a reputation. Yeah, yeah. But GW, uh, the, the only the only way GW maintains their stranglehold is because you know when you go to tournaments you have to play with official figures. So oh, yeah. even if you three, even if you three D print something better at home, you still can't use it when you go you know near them. So I know it's a shame. So it is. Look at this. Absolutely love this Warforged. I've been begging Greg to send me some files just so I can start printing these quickly. But like, look at that oh, Warforged. Yeah. Like, that, that, I I, that I don't care. Warforged. Anyone who likes a Warforged, there, there's never been a Warforged sculpt like the no. one that we're putting out, that's for sure. <laughs> that's what gets me. Like, why? I, I'm really not a fan of the Warforged artwork. Like, see the official, like, Warforged, like, you know, the artwork for them. I just don't like the look of them at all. And I think you could do, like, that is just a much better job. And I must say, it kind of reminds me of, like, uh, Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Few people have said that. It's funny. It wasn't. It wasn't from that, <laughs> but uh, I do see the similarity now that people pointed it out. But it, yeah. it's just a badass model, no, uh, and he comes. The thing you haven't seen yet, I haven't shown it yet. He, every weapon that he's wearing on his back, there's an option for him to be holding those weapons. So he's going to come with like four different weapon options. Oh my! So this is a. Uh, if... I, I used to treat myself to an occasional Forge World model too. And those were like 150, 200 bucks each. Oh now, yeah. Now, now I print models like that and it cost me two, three bucks. It's crazy. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's genuinely is. Now, don't get me wrong. I know everyone is like kind of looking at it. It's like, oh, don't really know if I want to spurge that much money on a printer. You know, it is an awful lot of money and it is an awful lot to get into. Like it is, there is a lot to learn. It's it's really not as simple as plug in and play. Like there, you you will be pulling your hair out at some stage. Like that's just a guarantee. Like, you will be doing that. Like, you know, and people say, it's like, no, no, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. It's like, no, trust me. It's 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 not always as easy as they say, you know, but it does come right. with time. But it does get easier. And I think at this stage, like, you know, for me, I don't have any issue with uh, printed models. Like, you know, and even if I do have an issue, I can tell what it is um, very quickly. Like, it doesn't take me very long at all. But that's just something you get with time. You know what I mean? It's almost like painting. You know what I mean? Like you look at your first model that you ever painted to the last one you've done, and you can see definitely an increase in quality over time. Most definitely. Yeah, but I you think. know, for some people though, if, if people you know do a little research and they but nowadays you buy your printer, you know, you check out my YouTube channel a little bit, you check out uh, proper settings for your machine. I've seen people buy a new machine, you know level it properly their first time and then print pre-support models and get like fantastic results day one that's not going to be everyone but the people who do it right you know you can you can literally start off doing uh some pretty amazing stuff if you just prepare a little bit in advance it's more it's more meant to be a filler like it wouldn't be your main game on game yeah. night or anything but like if you're playing dnd &D, you're playing warhammer mm. when you get that downtime you get a break in between mm. games whatever you can play this for you know 10 to 15 minutes and have a blast you know, yeah. and, and, you know, just it's really just a filler. I think I, it looks pretty cool. It does have. I think it's got a lot of potential, and I think you could add to it down the road. Like, there's so much you could add to it. You know, you oh, could keep going. If, if the game's well received, which I'm hoping it will be, mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely going to expand it and I'm going to come up with uh, some some more complex rules in case people want that. Some some ways to add some D and D monsters into the mix because now it's mostly humanoids. Yeah. Although I am about to. Um, add in a Zorn, which is, mm. for some reason, I, I like those guys, so I'm adding one in. But uh, yeah, I was thinking of expanding it to include monsters and to include uh, fights for parties. So again, in, yeah. you know, people playing D&D, &D, if they want to work it into their adventure, uh, there'd oh, be a way to yeah, do yeah, that actually would be really good. Yeah, you could actually do that. Now that you mentioned that, that's actually really cool. Like, we sub-game you could have put it into the... Oh, yeah, I like that, actually. No, that's actually really cool. Now you bring that up, I'm definitely doing this. Uh, one yeah. other thing I was mean to ask you: What are you doing with the goals set? Like, um, are you going to be selling the goals? Like, say after your Kickstarter, 
Uh, are you just putting well, no, it out rules for free alone on... be f- r- Rules will be free. Mm. So people will always be able to grab the rules and, and any updates to them. Uh, and and I'm even going to make um, kind of like a character generator. So if people want to play with their own D&D character or their favorite Warhammer character, I'm going to give you the tools so you can create the stats for your characters. You can use them in the game. Because I know people like me, especially, I get attached to my characters. Oh, yeah. I'd rather... I'd rather use them than the generic character sometimes. So I'm going to give people the ability to uh, to do that. I th- oh, oh, it's so yeah, cool. Yeah. And it, 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 it really is. It's, it's sci-fi type shit. Almost. It's so cool. But, yeah, uh, it's like, well, for me, every time I, I, I open up my printer, it's like Christmas when I see something. I mean, I'm like, wow, I just made that. Like, mm. to me, it's still incredible. Like, but the, the thing is, like, for someone who plays like me, like, okay, even for Warhammer some, but let's, let's talk about D&D, although this applies to Warhammer the same way. Like when I first got my printer, uh, for my group, uh, we were we were doing an adventure where they were fighting goblins, and I'm DMing. If I was buying figures, I'd buy like you know four or five goblin figures, you know, and maybe there'd be like two different types. Maybe I'd even buy ten of them, and there'd be like five of each or whatever. Instead, I 3D printed because it basically didn't cost me anything once I had the models. I printed like 40 goblins, and because they were modular, and there was like six different ones in the pack I got from Arzen's Guild. I think I printed like the, the six of them. I just mirrored them. That already gave me 12. And then I printed up like 12 more like that. And then they all have different weapon options. In the end, I made like 24 unique goblins and it cost me like four or five bucks. I never would have bought that many figures. So instead, our adventure looked 100 times cooler because I had all the models there instead of having to use the same crappy like one or two models over and over again, you know? Yeah. Here, let me get, I'll get up the goblins on screen so people can see them. They're, they're awesome. Ours and gold stuff so ridiculously. It's just so good. Like, honestly, it's hard to find models that actually look that nice, though. Like, genuinely, I remember, like, not even five years ago, the best you would get is just to use Games Workshop stuff or maybe some Leaper models, you know? And even then, I was never the biggest fan of Leaper models. I don't know why. I just never really enjoyed them that much. I tried them, but I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, yeah, just... yeah. Ho- hopefully they, don't, they won't get mad at me, but when I, when I, the, the Reaper models, I, I found, I don't, for the most part, I find their sculpts to be lacking. And, and I find the sculptors in our 3D world now are putting out just amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. Hey, look, the sculptors we're working with, let's talk about Arzen Guild just for a second, I'm gonna digress. So their, their main sculptor was the main sculptor for Raging Heroes, sculpting 90% of their of their blockbuster stuff. Now he's Arzen Guild, so you're getting that same quality sculpt you get from Games Workshop or Raging Heroes, but you're getting it you know, now they're putting out 20 models a month for for $10. It's just insane. Which so, get. Yeah, it is. It really is. And then, of course, now you're saying about it, Legion Heroes, they've jumped on the bandwagon and seen with Titanforge. They've jumped on it as well. Like, you know, they're putting out STLs to print. I wish they'd let me do a fucking of a license to print though honest to god to see the time for it stuff it looks so good it looks ridiculously <laughs> good but i i've got this thing where if i if i'm not able to print to sell it i can't justify getting the picking up picking up the patreon you know what i mean i just like no no i'm i really no i'm gonna focus on just stuff that i'm gonna sell as well at the same time you know and i just can't blame myself i might buy some stuff off my mini factory from time to time but that would be it you know yeah, yeah. Well, especially because the, I mean, with the amount of models people are putting out now, it's easy to build up a huge library of incredible models. I mean, I, for me, I, I'm actually fascinated because I got into this because of really because of, of Dungeons and Dragons, and I was looking at buying a bunch of stuff and a bunch of terrain, and then I came upon 3D printing and saw what people could print, and it looked just as good or better. And when I did the cost in my head, it came out way cheaper. So that that that's what made me first take the plunge into 3D printing in the first place. Yeah, like, oh, that's kind of well. I always had my eye on it. It was a big meme in like the 40k community of like, oh, I'm just going to 3D print all my models. You know what I mean? It yeah. was always like, oh, f- fuck you, Games Workshop. I'm just going to print all my models. But of course, at that time, like back in like 2013, 14, that just. Like, you know, and everyone just had, like, Ender 3s and stuff at the time. And it, let's be honest, it just, they don't look that nice. FDM yeah, like they look, they look okay. You look, the pictures, but... you look at the pictures I sent you, right, just on, mm. on Discord here. Mm. If you look at those versus, you know, what you could print just two, three years ago, it's it's a million times better. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's not even close. And I think if people, people who haven't looked at 3D printing, if they look at, like, these models we're printing out, they'll realize, oh, my God. 
these models are, are GW quality and in some cases a lot better. Yeah. And you can just print them at home for 25, 30 cents instead of paying five, 10 bucks a model. Like it's a no brainer. The machine pays for itself. If you're someone who games a lot and actually buys figures, these machines pay for themselves like within the, in the first six months, you know? Easy, yeah, easily within the first six months. I would say it's under that, if I'll be honest with you. Oh yeah, that's Yeah, and the, the other thing is, and I think you mentioned it, you just mentioned, but let's talk about it. For people who don't have printers, you can scale models to any size you want, basically. Mm -hmm. So, James, if you look at what I just, the picture I just sent you, here's an example of, uh, on the right is a figure that is 40 millimeters tall, and then to the left of it, I scaled it up to 110 millimeters tall uh, because you can just change the size to whatever you want. So if you if you have a figure like this that I liked, I said, hey, this thing would make a good statue. I just scale it up way bigger and print it. And then I'm going to send you another picture where I painted it up as a statue so people can see. And uh, it, it's pretty cool to be able to change the sizes to whatever you want. So there, there have been times when I want to buy a sculpt in the past, where, whether it's from Reaper or Games Workshop or anything, and I look and the size is not what I want. It's not going to fit with my other figures. Yeah. Now the 3D printer, I just change the size to whatever the hell I want. So it, it's it's so convenient to be able to scale however you want. Like people don't. That's like an underestimated thing of 3D printing that people need to need to look at more. Oh yeah, definitely. It's because I think I think I saw the picture, or was it in one of your videos where you painted a Dia statue? I can't remember now. I'm not too sure. I yeah, I, oh, I just yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you did with the yeah. Marvel so, effect. Show, show those two sets of pictures mm. to the people, and they'll see what you can do with 3D printing that, you know, buying models you could just never do. You know, yeah. it's not possible. But uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm trying to think, is there anything else we need to bring up or anything else we really need to talk about? Like, you know, honest to God, like, if you guys have been thinking about picking up a 3D printer, you really just shouldn't. Like, you know, if you've been thinking about it, you should go for it. Like, you know, especially if you paint a lot of models, if that's what you're into. Um, having a 3D printer is just, I think it's definitely the way to go. You know, I think you'd be mad not to. If you have the space for it, I would say it's definitely something to check out. And even with the smell, you can add like extractor fans, you can have like really fancy setups. You know, I've seen loads of people do like really weird stuff, but it does work, like, you know. Uh, oh yeah, on my first printer I had a, I, you know, there, I just had an inline fan, like what people use to grow marijuana, mm -hmm. an inline fan with a duct and, and, and into a charcoal filter and it just filters everything out. So, and that was only like 30, 40 bucks. So you, you can take care of the smell many different ways. But I think for anyone out there, anyone who actually loves miniatures, if you mm -hmm. love miniatures, then you should get a 3D printer because every day becomes Christmas for you. Every day you can print something and it's just amazing. So if you truly love miniatures, uh, it opens up a whole world to you that that just doesn't exist when you're buying stuff, you know, physical product. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like it really is. There's no competition. I think at this point, it feels like. And also with like your know, games like um, what do you call Legion Heroes and Titan Forge and ones like that that are starting to embrace three D printing. I think it's only like I think the only thing that putting Games Workshop off it is they just hate like I don't I could imagine them just not being able to live with themselves. The idea of putting out like um STLs and them getting pirated or whatever. I could just like, Yeah, just, I, I agree with you. I think look, because in our industry we the one thing we can't stop is theft. Mm. So I think companies like Game Workshop that are very jealous of their intellectual property, I think they know once they release a file, you know, there's gonna be tens of thousands of people stealing it for free. But I look at it this way, and maybe they'll come around. In our industry right now, as I said, there is a lot of theft, but that's not stopping people from actually paying for the files, because most people pay for them, they don't steal them. Yeah. And it's not holding our industry back. There's more and more money being made in 3D printing. So I look at it this way. Every shopping store, right, every grocery store or department store, people steal from those. But that doesn't make the store close down, just because there's some theft doesn't mean yeah. you, you know you can't be in that in that market so the theft in our world it happens but big deal you know it, yeah. it doesn't really seem to affect anything that badly and even then like you know i think most people are actually quite happy to support the artists you know i think you do you do grow a bit connected to the artists that you subscribe to you know because it is something like you know say you come across one and they've just got that style that you really enjoy you know and it's just it doesn't matter even if they put out a set it's like like for instance, Artisan Guild, fine example, I'll get this one up. I absolutely hated this set. I really didn't like the look of it. I was like, oh God, please, anything but this. That Scourge Gun set, I absolutely hated the look of it. Like, it's just not for me. I don't know, I just didn't like it. But I think they did a really good job and the whole style and the aesthetic I do like. 
but it's just the setting I was like oh no please don't <laughs> you know anything but that bar that they've actually put out any like I, I can't believe they made tabaxi cull you know what I mean like that's saying a lot for me like, I, like to be tabaxi have just got a bit of a bad um reputation to say the least you know but i think they actually did a really good job giving them this like indian vibe sort of thing going on i think they did a really cool job of it you know uh, i think you mentioned the artist and, and that's actually another good thing to talk about aside from being able to make all the stuff at home we've been talking about in this community you get to interact directly with the sculptors and actually talk to them and have them respond to you like in what other industry like you're buying a product, you're buying, you know, your smartphone, you're buying a TV, you're buying a car. You can't talk to the person designing that and get input. In our world, you can actually talk to the sculptors and people say, hey, change the way this looks or can you do this yeah. or can you do that? And the artists actually respond and, and we actually direct the artists, which is, mm. to me, that interaction is just amazing. Oh, in, yeah. In the printing world. A lot of the time, like, you know, if you come up with something, you say, like, mate, it would be really cool, though, wouldn't it? And they're like, yeah, actually, it would be really cool. Let's do it. Fuck it. You know what I mean? You do get that quite a lot. If they just like the idea, it's like, you know what? Actually, yeah, sure. Fuck it. We'll run with them. You know, that sounds yeah, good look, to me. I work with a lot of the artists. So I, I, I'm on the inside with a bunch of the artists. And I know for a fact, like, when people suggest stuff, if enough people suggest it or an idea is good enough, the artist would be like, yeah, let's just do that. And in no other industry, like, you would never get Games Workshop to alter a sculpt based on what you said, right? <laughs> yeah. But in our world, in our world, you actually can get an artist to listen to you and sculpt something based on your feedback, which is it, totally amazing to me. Uh, anyway, anyway, I think we're gonna wrap this up here nice for a while. I'm, okay. gonna ch I'm gonna chop this up and I'll upload it. What day is today? Today is... Thursday the 12th. Thursday the 12th. And how many days left to run your Kickstarter? You can still get uh, late. It yeah. ends on the, uh, it ends on the 18th. Yeah, and you can still pick up late uh, pledges, can't you? Like down the road. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think I think it works for, like my mini factory and stuff. But uh, if you're interested in picking this up, it is only thirty dollars, and you do get an awful lot with it. And as Greg says, he is looking to support it down the road, increase like you know the models you can put in, make like you know what was it you were saying about like you know putting in like stat blocks so you can like you know put in your own characters into this. I do love the idea of integrating this into um because everyone says like you know when you play like a west march game or whatever and like you know there's always that one fighter that says oh i'm gonna start a fighting pit as like a side business well now you've actually got it you know um uh, <laughs> which is pretty cool i think but yeah. as i say as i say i think we're gonna wrap it up here i hope you guys enjoy uh definitely check out greg on your also you'll find him on facebook like it's, it's kind of hard to it's hard to avoid him on facebook i, f I feel like <laughs> any 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 uh any post i see about 3d printing when i'm scrolling down it's like yeah greg's on that one but uh honestly very um very helpful to say the least and as i say it's not quite as simple as plugging and play but i think this uh pet fighter is the best place to start if you wanted to plug in and play you know i think it's genuinely the easiest you probably are going to get and uh trying out greg's models before like you know the supports they just peel away it's ge it's great you don't even need to use clippers or anything you can just pull them out and that's it as long as you're gentle within reason you know uh anyway anyway sorry about the rambling uh i'm gonna love yous and leave yous all i'm gonna chop this up gonna upload this tonight tomorrow whenever whatever time it takes me to finish um, Greg, it's great to have you on. Honestly, very right, good. Thank you. The, the, thank weird you. Thing, the weird thing is, this is the first time I've actually spoken to you, like, uh, like on the phone. Uh, but I've spoken to Greg. I don't know how many times for, for, over the past like year and a half, maybe two years now. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, anyway, it's, it's, the first, it's the first live uh, voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway. Um, see you later. Talk to you in the near future. Bye -bye. All right. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Today's video. Uh, we're going to show you a sample game. There's going to be another video of kind of a learn how to play later on. But for now, just to give you a flavor of how the game works. And what you're going to see is uh, when we play, there's basically six basic attacks, which I'll, I'll replace my head uh, and face here with a close-up of the six basic attacks. But what you think of it as rock, paper, scissors, if you had six choices instead of three choices. So the attacks... Uh, the first three attacks work like rock, paper, scissors. Each one is stronger against another one. The fourth attack, which is called defensive stance, the fourth attack is kind of a soft counter to all three. 
The fifth attack is a hard counter to the fourth attack, the defensive stance. And then the sixth one is shove your opponent. That's the one where you can actually drive them towards the environmental hazard or drive them onto environmental hazard, which in most cases will kill them. So I'll give you a close up of this sheet and we'll go through it real quick. Um, when we play, uh, we, we use the sheet, which describes everything and has your uh, attack bonuses and or penalties and all modifiers. Or if I hold it the right way, uh, I also made a kind of like handy little grid that, that shows you how every attack at interacts with every other attack. So you can use either one of these when you're playing until you get to know them, which doesn't take long, by the way, because there's not many of them. So it's pretty easy stuff, but it's good to keep these handy as a cheat sheet, or you can use this one. So you'll see that when we go to the game. And uh, it won't be as exciting as a real game because I'll be narrating over to explain what's going on. When we play for real, like every roll is like, ooh, ah, ah. you know, you, if you get a bad roll when you have the advantage, it's really frustrating. Just like in D&D &D or any other game, when you get the edge and then you roll bad. So the dice come into it. But if you can read your opponent better than they can read you, or I guess just outguess them, whichever works, uh, you do get a significant advantage and it kind of minimizes the impact of the dice uh, by giving yourself big modifiers to help you hit your opponent or shove them backwards. So I don't want to waste too much time talking. Let's, let's quickly go through the attacks. I'll explain each one very briefly as we look at them. And then let's just jump right into a game. And again, I'll narrate and explain what's going on. And you'll see by watching this for just a couple of minutes how easy it's going to be to learn and to play and how fast the gameplay will actually be. And also, hopefully, it'll give you an idea of how much fun it is to kill your opponent or to get killed and get your revenge on the next round or whatever. You'll see how it feeds into. You, we normally never play one round in my house when we play. We always usually end up whoever loses like best two out of three or best three out of five because it's the kind of game that makes you get your juices flowing a little bit if you're competitive at all. So anyway, let's take a look at, at the six attacks and how they interact together and then we'll just jump right into a game, okay? So there are six attack actions you can choose from each turn when you're planning your attack. Precise Strike, Mortal Blow, Attack Stance, Defensive Stance, Breaker, and Shove or Force a Retreat. So let's look a lot closer at the first three because those three almost are rock, paper, scissors to each other. So Precise Strike gives you plus two additional modifier to your attack roll. If your opponent has chosen Defensive Stance, instead you subtract two from that attack roll. If your opponent has chosen Mortal Blow, and this is the hard counter to Mortal Blow, you add four to your attack roll, so it gives you a really big bonus and a good chance of taking, you know, getting a hit in. Second one is Mortal Blow. Mortal Blow, your warrior is trying to wind up for a huge strike. Because of that, you subtract two from your attack roll because it's harder to hit. But if you do hit, you add three to the damage roll, which is a lot. If the opponent has chosen defensive stance, which as I had mentioned is a soft counter to all of these, you instead of subtracting two, you subtract four from your attack roll, but you still add the three damage if you are successful. But if your opponent has chosen attack stance, this is, this is a hard counter to attack stance, instead of subtracting two from your attack roll, you don't subtract anything. You have no attack modifier penalty and you still add your plus three damage. The third one is attack stance. In attack stance, you get plus one on your attack roll and plus one to your damage roll, so it, it's pretty useful. But if your opponent has chosen precise strike, you get to add three to your attack roll. And if the opponent has chosen defensive stance, which is, again, as I had said, is a soft counter to all of these, you instead subtract one from your attack roll instead of adding one. And you subtract one from your damage roll instead of adding one. So those are the first three. They kind of go in a circle. And as I'd said, they're all kind of soft countered by defensive stance. So if you let's take a look now at the next three. If you choose defensive stance, it doesn't give you bonuses or penalties against anything, but it basically counters every attack listed out here, except for, and let's look at number five, breaker. Breaker is what you use when you think your opponent is gonna turtle because defensive stance is a pretty decent stance in general. Breaker punishes your opponent and grants you a bonus of plus three to your attack roll if you've read correctly and guessed that they're going to use defensive stance 
or shove, which is number six. Let's talk about shove. Shove on a, sec a successful attack roll. This is the only attack when you hit. You do not get to roll for damage. If you have a successful attack roll, instead you drive your opponent one space towards their backside and you follow them. So both figures move one space toward uh, the, the other champion. So from your starting position, and let's, let's actually look at a diagram of it. Uh, from your starting position, you would then move so that your opponent had his quote unquote or her back to the wall right against an environmental hazard in the arena. And that is diagram two. That's a successful uh, shove by the dwarf. Puts the orc uh, right up against the hazard. He doesn't take damage yet. But if on the next turn or any subsequent turn from that position, the dwarf makes a successful shove and the orc does not make a successful shove or you know just picks a different attack in general and the dwarf is successful, the orc would be driven into the environmental hazard and this case would suffer suffer 15 damage. Uh, a lot of champions, you know, have 14 or less health, so they would die instantly. Some champions can survive one push into the uh, environmental hazards if they're not wounded. Um, so it's, it's very powerful to shove your opponent in. The other thing to note is when your back, when your champion's back is against the wall, so to speak, you do get a plus two bonus on your shove attack roll so you know when you get normally if you play this game you'll see once you get your back to the wall you almost have to pick shove to try to get out of there to try to move back to the middle because if you don't move out of there and your opponent's able to get a successful shove on you instead uh it's not good for you and then uh in figure three pictures of three shown here if from the middle position, uh, the second picture, where the uh, orc has his back against the wall, let's say the dwarf fails his shove roll, but the orc is successful in his shove roll, they move just back to the middle of the arena, back to the starting spots. So, so shove is very easy. So those are the six attack actions you can choose, and you'll see as we jump into the game in a minute, uh, it is represented by a six-sided die. That six-sided die, when you're choosing, is hidden from your opponent by the cover of your battle planner. So you will choose your attack action in secret, and you will be trying to guess what your opponent is doing. And then you will both reveal at the same time, and then you will resolve those actions. So depending what you pick and what your opponent picks, will tell you what modifiers to add or subtract from your attack roll and your damage roll. So let's take a look at it. So you can see the covers are on the act, battle planners. I've chosen the Samurai Girl, she's chosen Dwarf Lord. We move our figures to the middle. We choose our attacks in secret behind with the covers on the battle planner. Uh, she's chosen defensive stance, you can see. I've chosen precise strike. She has turned her special ability on. So when we reveal, since her special ability of the Dwarf Lord is an active ability, she gets to use it this turn. She gets to change her attack to counter mine. So she picks attack stance because it counters precise strike. We both roll to attack. She has a much bigger bonus than me. Luckily, I got a high roll and I hit, but she also hit. So since the attacks happen simultaneously, we can both roll for damage now. Now on the damage, uh, you add from the card, mine is D6 plus one, and from Precise Strike, I get no other bonus. So she takes three damage. On hers, she has D6 plus two, and she gets a bleed effect, by the way. Samurai Girl has a passive special, which puts a minus three bleed every turn after it's on there. Now for hers, uh, I took a lot of damage because she used a tax and she got a plus one to damage. She has a plus two from her card that's already plus three. So I took six damage. I'm sorry, five damage. We put our covers back on. Now we choose our actions in secret. Dwarf Lord's special action is now used, can't be used again. She flips that to off for the rest of the game. She also added the bleed token because the passive of Samurai Girl is to inflict a bleed upon a successful damaging attack. That bleed will now take effect at the end of every subsequent round. We reveal our actions. Uh, she has chosen Mortal Blow to try to finish me off. And I have chosen Attack Stance to try to make sure I get a hit and some damage in here. We both roll. She did not hit, and I did not hit. So she still takes the three. She has that bleed effect. This is the first round it takes effect. So she still loses three health. She's now down to eight health. That's the end of that turn. We put our covers back on. 
We begin to select in secret again. This time she is choosing a tax dance. I don't know that, of course. So what did I choose? I can't even remember as I'm doing this. Narrating. I was thinking a lot trying to guess what she was doing. And I picked... What did I pick? I picked number four. I went defensive stance to be safe. Because she has the bleed on her, I figured let me play it safe and just let her bleed out. The Dwarf Lord. So we both roll for our attacks. I was actually uh, able to hit her. And... She actually also hit me. I rolled a three, plus one is four. But she also takes three more because of the bleed. That bleed is really working now. So all in all, she took seven damage. And uh, she rolled a one. And because she used a tax stand, she gets another one and she has two, so I took four. So I am now, with Samurai Girl, very near death. One more hit and she'll be able to finish me. But remember, she took seven, so she's also down to one health. So now we're both in jeopardy of dying from the next hit. So she is now down to one. She will die next turn from the bleed no matter what. So she has to kill me. Otherwise, Samurai Girl will prevail. If she hits me and kills me, though, it'll just be a draw. This game does result in many draws, by the way, since actions are resolved simultaneously. She is choosing Precise Strike to try to get that big bonus to hit. And knowing that she just needs to hit me, I'm going defensive stance again. She probably should have guessed Breaker and gotten the bigger bonus against me. But she did not guess me. And uh, I have defensive stance, so she has a pretty big penalty on her roll here. And I hit. And she did not hit. Un unlucky dice on her part. And four damage plus that bleed. And the dwarf is dead. And that's how fast it can happen. Just a couple rounds and boom, we've got a winner. So this game, and I, it might not look as exciting without hearing the lie. I, you know, I say stuff like, I know you're going defensive stance. You know, you, you play head games. It's it's really fun. It's really exciting, really fast paced. We did it a little slower here. So it was trying to, you know, kind of easier to follow along. So I'm really hoping uh, once you guys see the video on how to learn how to play, You'll pick it up. You can learn how to play in just a couple minutes. You can be playing. And I promise you, if you play a few rounds, you know, if you're winning, you'll want to keep winning. If you're losing, you'll want revenge. Believe me, uh, if you're competitive at all, uh, it starts to get in your head. And it's also fun to bet things like who's going to do chores. Uh, if you have friends over, who's going to pay for the pizza. You can just bet all little kind of stuff on it to make it, you know, that much more interesting. When I play with my kids for chores, it gets really heated. Believe me. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments and I will start answering them. I'm convinced if you try the game, you will enjoy it. And for those of you who aren't interested in the game at all, rest assured there are more great minis coming and more free gifts coming. I am vowing to make this the, the most valuable Kickstarter for your dollar ever. So thanks for the support, everybody.